I've done a couple of Connect projects this year. And the thing I like about Connect projects is the way that it helps make te technology invisible. Invisible in that all it requires is a tiny lens into the room in order to understand what's going on in there. Maybe how many people are there, which direction they're facing. Maybe to also employ a little bit of machine learning to understand what sex they are, how old they are, maybe the objects they've got in their hands. Because when you can apply a little bit of technology to invisible things, then we can, we can really have the opportunity to surprise and delight. Now, we believe that an invisible revolution is coming about now because we're able to embed sensors into everything, everything that we have. And as that happens, it increases our capabilities uh, to make surprising experiences. The invisible revolution is coming to our homes. We maybe haven't seen it, we maybe can't touch it, we maybe can't hear it, but it's there. So please welcome to the stage Kevin Ashton to talk about the things that we can connect. So I'm uh, going to take your picture. Feel free to wave or smile or look grumpy, whatever you want to do. I will, uh, I'm going to run an Internet of Things algorithm, recognize your faces and see who's paying attention and who isn't. I will publicly shame you. No, I'm kidding. I'm now sending your picture to Twitter, where the, the world can, uh, can look at you. So what I just did seems very ordinary today. I took a, a small device out of my pocket. I just took a high-definition movie of everybody here in London, and now the world can look at it. You can look at it too. I just gave you a great excuse to be looking at your cell phone rather than listen to me. If you look at the hashtag future decoded any second now, you should be able to see your picture. Um, had I done that 10 years ago, it would have seemed miraculous. And 11 years ago, had I predicted that I would be able to do that, it would have seemed ridiculous. So one of the interesting things about the future is not how quickly things change, but how quickly we get used to how quickly things change. One day it's impossible, the next day it's a miracle, the day after that it's just ordinary and we're very used to it. And I want to keep that in mind as we talk about the Internet of Things because you know, a lot of what I'm going to tell you will seem amazing, miraculous, possibly ridiculous. That doesn't make it any less true. And as an example, this picture here is not the planet Earth. This is a photograph of Pluto. Now, 85 years ago, this was miraculous. This was a photograph of Pluto, and nobody knew there was such a thing as Pluto 86 years ago, so this seemed incredible. 21 years ago, even more incredible. Four years ago, six months ago, two months ago, this iconic image of Pluto, and then one month ago, amazing high-definition surface photography. This is how the future comes at us. There's something blurry and indistinct and amazing, and gradually technology makes it possible to enhance it, make it even better, make it even more amazing. 
And by the way, the same technologies that are driving the Internet of Things, like advanced sensing, incredible radio communication capability, are also behind our ability to take this picture. But there's something else that's really interesting about the future, and that's what happens if we look at one of the last pictures that the New Horizons spacecraft that took this photograph took. So, so what does the picture look like from two weeks ago? Oh, we're kind of back to the same kind of image we had 85 years ago, except this is not Pluto. This is one of Pluto's satellites. This is Kerberos. It's tiny. It was only discovered in 2011, and what this picture shows us is something we didn't know until two weeks ago, which is that Kerberos has this unusual dual lobe shape. It's like a figure eight kind of moon. So you get to a point with the future where everything's high definition and amazing, but then beyond that is a new step into the unknown. And so, you know, my job is kind of, I'm, I'm a futurist. I have to sort of say things about the future. And here's, here's my conclusion. My job is actually easy. It is incredibly easy to predict the future and to do so with some accuracy. The hard thing is believing. So I'm going to tell you some things about the future right now. And only a few people in this room will truly believe them. Those people will have an advantage over everybody else because they will begin to prepare for and imagine the world of tomorrow. You know, the easiest prediction to make about the future is things are going to change. That can be hard to believe for some people. But let me tell you some things about the future. And keep in mind, the fact that you might not believe them doesn't make them any less true. Some people find this controversial. It may be that, that 2030 is, is too far out. It may be you own a self-driving car by 2025, and self-driving cars are Internet of Things technologies, and we'll talk about them a little bit more. Um, a hundred years ago, the average life expectancy on the planet was, was not anything over 50. Depending on how old you are, your children, your great-grandchildren, your grandchildren, a future generation not that far removed from you will have a reasonable expectation of living beyond 100. Living beyond 100 will not be a big deal in a few generations' time. Um, you know, building a little bit on the fact we can take some amazing images of places like Pluto now, um, it's almost certain there's life out there in the universe. We're finding abundant evidence of water, habitable planets, pieces of DNA spread across the universe. And our ability to sense things remotely is increasing as well. So we'll probably discover extraterrestrial life this century, possibly in our lifetimes. That does not mean ET will be here trying to phone home but we'll find evidence of biology in other places. And coupled with that, maybe within our lifetimes, maybe not, somebody is going to get born on another planet and we're going to be on the verge of becoming an interplanetary species. Will this person be an alien? I don't know. This is an easy prediction to make. Surprises some people. 50% plus one of the population of the planet is likely to be vegetarian by 2100. That's a trend that's already happening. 30% of India is vegetarian already, and the Indian population is growing faster than most other countries' population, for example. There are lots of reasons why this is likely to be true. And in case you're wondering how I can make any of these predictions because you've heard that the zombie apocalypse is nearly upon us and the, the human race is about to become extinct. Here's another thing I can predict. We will survive climate change. 
There is such a thing as climate change. It is a horrible problem. We will figure out how to mitigate its effects, how to not make it worse, and the human race will continue. This, by the way, is the easiest prediction to make. If you only make one prediction, make this one, because if you're wrong, there won't be anybody around to remind you. <laughs> so let's talk about the Internet of Things. Here's a prediction that surprises some people. Within 20 years, most computers will power themselves. Well, what do I mean by that? When we think of computers today, we probably think of things like laptops, tablets, smartphones, and we know they consume power. You have to charge them up every night, plug them in regularly. The thing to keep in mind is what's consuming the power is not the computing. It's the display. It's the wireless connection. It's the access to memory, the hard drive, and so on. The actual computing part, the mathematical part, the processing of the data is relatively energy light. Battery technology is improving remarkably. We're also developing ways to harvest power from things like sound vibrations, radio waves, and so on. So devices that do math will not need their batteries replaced, will not need to be recharged very soon. And those kind of devices will outnumber all the other kind of devices. Now, this is a super safe prediction because actually it's already true. You may have heard of Moore's Law. In fact, this technical audience, you have heard of Moore's Law. The law that's probably going to be the Moore's Law of the early 21st century is this one. This is Kumi's Law named after Jonathan Kumi, who's a professor at Stanford, who was the first named author on a paper that made this incredible observation. With incredible consistency, the amount of energy required to perform a computation has halved every 18 months since the beginning of computing. This is independent of Moore's Law, by the way. There's some interaction, but there's something else going on here as well underneath Kumi's Law. So the energy required to do computing is going down at the same time battery technology is improving and so on and so on. And that leads us to this world. An example of a batteryless, batteryless computer is something called an RFID tag. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. This is one of the original Internet of Things technologies. It is like the amoeba of the wireless networking world. A single chip, can't do very much, can only communicate its identification number, typically, and is powered by the radio waves coming from the device that is interrogating it. But it still needs to be able to do math. And it needs to be able to do math because of something called anti-collision. If you're a networking person, you know about this already. If you're not, just keep in mind that only one thing can talk at once in any communication system, otherwise everything gets confused. So you need a way to organize who talks when. And that requires an RFID tag to do math. Now, as you can see here, smartphones, we all agree are ubiquitous. They're probably the most ubiquitous kind of computer in the world now, or at least the most ubiquitous kind of visible computer in the world. And, you know, we make about three billion smartphones a year right now. This chart is not cumulative. This is every year. But we make a billion more RFID tags a year than we do smartphones. Where are they? They're in payment systems, they're in ticketing systems, they're in hotel key cards, and so on. So in 2014, for example, yeah, we made 3 billion smartphones, but we made 4 billion RFID tags. And smartphones pretty much dominate the computing landscape, so you can more or less say 4 out of 7, which is more than half of all the computing devices in the world made in 2014, didn't have a battery. 
And this is what I mean about predicting being easy but believing being hard. Now, why is that important? That is important because we live in a connected world. And when I say connected world, I don't mean computer networks. This map shows airline routes. This is a network of air travel. What travels on aeroplanes? Cargo, luggage, people, things, physical things, things made of atoms, not things made of ones and zeros, not things made of bits. And this network is about 75 years old. Here's another one, even older, much older, and very relevant given we're right here on the side of the Royal Victoria docks. This is the shipping network. This is the network that, that built London. This is the network that built the British Empire. This map is from the 20th century, but if you look at a map of shipping lanes from the 17 or 1800s, it doesn't look much different. So this is the connected world. And again, those ships are not carrying data. They're not carrying ones and zeros. They're carrying things, raw materials, finished goods, and so on. So we've always lived, or nearly always lived, in this highly connected world. Now, here's the latest network, right? This is the internet. These are all the cables and things that connect different countries and continents on the internet. This is our latest network. Now, this is a network of bits. This is the ones and zeros. The idea of the internet of things is to connect this network of bits to those networks of things so we can manage all the stuff in the world more efficiently. But before I talk about what the Internet of Things is, I want to spend a moment talking about what the Internet of Things is not. There is a notion that a thing must be a device, something you plug into the wall. So when we're talking about things, we must be talking about toasters and refrigerators. What did the toaster say to the refrigerator? I don't know. I have no idea. If anybody knows a good punchline, please tell me. I could really use it. But that's not the Internet of Things. And, and more recently, the idea is that these devices must talk to an app, because everything is about apps. And even more recently, we have, have Kickstarter, which is where bad ideas go to raise money, as far as I can tell. And you get stuff like this. People ask me about this all the time. So these are real, just a few examples. Um, the smart wine bottle tells you whether or not you're drunk yet. Here's a clue. If you need to look an app on your smartphone to find out whether or not you're drunk, you're drunk. Smart bikini, are you sunburned? Smart water bottle, are you thirsty? Um, and then a recent entry on my slide, the smart shaver tells you whether or not you shaved yet. <laughs> Very useful if you don't have the smart wine bottle so you didn't know whether or not you were drunk the night before. This is not the Internet of Things. Here's another prediction. This stuff is stupid. Nobody's going to buy it. This is the Internet of Things. How much data is there in the world? Not data that we've captured, data that we could capture. Think about this room. How many people? What are their names? What's the temperature? What's the air pressure? How much particulate matter is there in the air? There is an almost unimaginably huge, we don't even have numbers for how much data there is in this room, let alone the world. When you think about how much data you could capture about the world, and how much data we do capture about the world, you come to the conclusion we really don't capture any data at all right now. What the Internet of Things is doing is allowing our information systems to capture their own information by themselves, kind of for themselves, 
using a wide array of sensors, all connected to the network. And we're turning the world into data. That's going to be one of the big themes of the 21st century, turning the world into data. And that data does not go with the greatest respect to our host at Microsoft, who already know this, that data does not go onto an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't even go into a pivot table. It goes into a machine learning system, a cloud-based machine learning system that sorts out all the stuff that nobody cares about, finds a few interesting things, and then produces a decision a decision that in some cases may be communicated to human beings who will do something differently. But in many cases will be communicated to another automated system, a robot or something. And either way, that decision will cause a change in the world. Decision, the output target is the world. And then we go back to the beginning again. Our sensor network detects something changing in the world, converts that to data, we make another decision, and around and around we go. That's the Internet of Things. When is it going to arrive? Well, it's already here. For example, this is not a phone. We call it a phone for legacy reasons. Think about how often you use your smartphone and how much of that time you spend making a phone call. Phone is just an app on your device, and it's probably not the one you use most often. You probably play Candy Crush or Angry Birds more than you use the phone to make phone calls. It's not really even a computer. What that is is a wireless sensor platform. A modern smartphone today has about 10 sensors. One of them is shown here, camera. That's vision sensing. Digital cameras were nowhere in the year 2000. They crossed the 1 billion units a year mark in 2013. Most of those were in phones. Now, you may think of a camera as a manual data capture device, but increasingly it's becoming automated. Everybody's familiar with facial recognition. We're moving into a world beyond facial recognition of object recognition as well. That's one of the sensors in your phone. Here's another one, location. Your phone knows where it is, even if you don't. GPS is actually, at least in the public sphere, a more recent technology even than digital photography. Yet it's proliferated incredibly quickly. It's hard to imagine how we lived without it today. And again, 2013, 1 billion units a year. That's sensor technology. Other sensors in your phone include altitude, barometric pressure, temperature, fingerprint, obviously microphone, sometimes heartbeat, motion. About 10 sensors. That's twice as many as we have. And about eight more sensors than your laptop computer. So what can you do with the Internet of Things? Here's one example. When you read about Uber or Lyft or Day Day or any of these ride-sharing services in the newspapers, it tends to be all about labor practices and people driving their own car and not being employees and so on. But there's another really interesting thing about Uber as an example. It's an Internet of Things service. There are two pieces of sensor data, where you are and where the nearest available ride is. And in the cloud, Uber connects those things and gets a car to you very quickly. Disrupting and displacing the previous technology we used to find taxis, which was this, standing on a street corner in the rain with your arm in the air, while nearby, a taxi driver was driving around hoping he or she could find a passenger. That's the Internet of Things. Building on that, self-driving cars. Sensor platforms on wheels connected to the network. Are self-driving cars safe, people ask me. 
Wrong question, I say. Are human-driven cars safe? And the answer is no. Nearly 3,300 people are killed by cars every single day worldwide. Nearly all of those due to what we politely call human error. But if you're looking at your cell phone or driving at 90 miles an hour while drunk, I don't think that's human error. Self-driving cars tend not to crash at all, by the way. Uh, and you know, they're real. Tesla Model S can, contains this wonderful autopilot technology now, senses cars around it, can change lanes in this kind of super cruise control mode. Other car manufacturers following up very quickly. So what's the big picture here? The big picture is really interesting. Throughout the 21st century, we're going to see, for really the first time in human history, the decoupling of inputs and outputs. Meaning, we can make more things using less stuff. And the reason we can do that has a large amount to do with information. Information being gathered automatically about the things in the world. And this is incredibly important because the human race needs to be a scalable species. Our population is growing massively. We'll be about 10 billion people by about 2090. And those people will be living to be 100 and expecting a much better quality of life where they do so. And we have finite resources. Climate change, by the way, is a result of the problem of inputs and outputs being too closely correlated. Information is the solution. So what role does the UK have to play in this? Well, one of the places you need to solve this problem of inputs and outputs most quickly is cities. And the world is urbanizing. You can see that on the white line here. About 40% of people in the world lived in cities in 1960. It's getting closer to 50% today, but not in the UK. The UK is one of the most urbanized countries in the world. The UK needs to find Internet of Things solutions because of the scaling problems associated with cities, and it is doing so. Think about contactless payment solutions for mass transit, for example. London is one of the pioneers of that. That's an example of Internet of Things in action. Cities are also very creative places. So the UK is very well positioned both to develop Internet of Things technologies because it needs Internet of Things technologies, but also because people are living in cities where they can connect and create very easily. There's a second reason. The UK is a technology economy. It's an interesting thing about high tech, kind of in the PC era. So since about 1989, the the world's high-tech exports, all the high-tech exports of all the countries in the world added together, has basically been the same once you adjust for inflation. 1989 today, it's about the same, but not in certain countries. And I put the US on this chart because uh, the US is often thought of as a very high-tech nation, but it's also a high-tech nation that doesn't do a lot of its own manufacturing, so it's, it's fairly similar to the UK. The interesting thing is, that the growth of the US high-tech economy, shown here on the blue line, is basically matched by the growth of the UK high-tech economy, occasionally exceeded by the UK high-tech economy. So that's the second reason. This is a growing high-tech economy. And then there's a third reason. The term Internet of Things was coined in 1999 by me, here. Some of our initial research was done at Cambridge University. The Internet of Things is from the UK, which proves we have everything we need here to be a leader in the 21st century as we develop this technology that's essential for the continued scaling of the human race. If you would like to 
know more about me, you can find me on Twitter here. This is my new book. 